First of all, before I begin, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, staffers of Advocates for not only once again putting on a great uh, event today, but for the work that you do for the members of Advocates each and every day. Greg, you've put together a great team. You're doing a great job. Now, I, um, as of the weekend, I couldn't speak. Uh, I had laryngitis, I had a bad cold, I still have it. Hopefully I can get through this without my voice giving out. Uh, I'm just going to pour myself a little water. <laughs> no vodka. Some scotch would be good. There are currently tremendous pressures on our clients, particularly in the form of international drivers, such as the Eurozone crisis and the derivatives mess, and the so-called pigs countries, and trends in other jurisdictions, specifically in the form of regulatory and product convergence. As well, Canada-specific problems, by which I mean primarily our borrowing and debt levels, are going to make dealing with these international problems more difficult, not to mention their making retirement planning much more problematic for individual Canadians and for cash-strapped governments. The solution, as I see it, lies in the nexus between macro and micro forces, between global problems and preferable outcomes, that nexus being the linchpin of individual financial planning, the advisor-client relationship. The advisor mediates between the client and these national and international pressures and offers individualized, tailor-made solutions. But the advisor-client relationship now faces the unpleasant and largely unnecessary burden of further regulatory hurdles. This client-advisor relationship, the domestic and the global pressures it is expected to withstand, and the recent past and likely future of this relationship will be the subject of my presentation this afternoon. We don't have to look too hard or too far in order to see how quickly the world is changing around us. We can't turn on the news, open a newspaper, or more commonly, the Gen X crowd, pull up the paper uh, on their iPads or other tablets and read what dire straits the global financial system is in. We continue to make adjustments to the global financial system to address the asset-backed commercial paper fiasco through requiring changes in trading of derivatives. The ABCP crisis almost froze the global financial system. The world came to the very brink of global economic paralysis, and this was only averted through the coordinated actions of the G20. And now we look at what's happening in the EU and the concerns over sovereign debts and the need for bailouts to ensure entire countries don't go bankrupt. Again, a default by any EU member state could spell disaster, not only for the EU economy, but the global economy. We look to our friends and neighbors south of the border, and one can't help but wonder at what point will the U.S. hit the debt wall, given that they are running deficit after deficit in the trillions of dollars. Just this year, 2011, the deficit in the U.S. is one point five trillion dollars. One point five trillion dollars. That is one thousand five hundred billion dollars. I won't tell you how many it is in millions, but anyway, that's a lot of money, whatever way you look at it. In addition to that, eighty percent, almost eighty percent of our trading is with the U.S. So given those facts, the uh, future uh, could be somewhat scary. We're now hearing rumblings about the possible next wave of the financial crisis, the impact of major defaults, and the impact this will have when counterparties who have entered credit default swaps expect payment. Sure, we're doing better than many other G7 and G20 countries, 
But finance is global, and that means that when the EU or the U.S. catches a cold, we sneeze. The financial maladies that are hurting the U.S. or EU are also hurting us here in Canada. The debts that are being racked up by countries on a global basis in an attempt to stave off prolonged recession have to be paid back at some point. So we're in a period where governments are spending money they don't have to steady the global economy and there is precious little left to fund programs and services that Canadians have come to consider as a right that comes with citizenship. The federal conservative government is working with their provincial counterparts and developing strategies and programs that will change the way Canadians think about their futures. The private sector is being given the opportunity to develop the solutions to the problems we face to ensure that the next generation has access to the same level of services and programs that we have benef benefited from. But there is one very clear message being sent. The cost of ensuring one's future comfort will be increasingly the responsibility of the citizen and not the state. In the G7, G20, Canada is a shining example for countries under pressure. We had our own severe debt problem 20 plus years ago, but we demonstrated that a country can undertake significant structural reform to address such problems. The government of the day, the Conservative government, under then Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, implemented two bold policy initiatives. First, the free trade agreement between Canada and the United States. This agreement has since expanded into the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico. Uh, the second initiative was the introduction of the GST, a consumption tax. When first introduced, both policy moves were considered to be bold and not without risk. But history has shown that both policy initiatives reformed the Canadian debt crisis. Canada went on to post surplus after surplus and addressed its debt crisis. But Canada is the exception. The history of previous sovereign debt crisis is not reassuring. When crushing levels of sovereign debt spiraling out of control, the outcome was usually a financial crisis and, in the recent cases of Russia in 1998 and Argentina in 2001, an economic meltdown. Historically, sovereign debt crisis, crises have frequently led to banking sector crisis. Emerging outcomes like Argentina's are one thing, but now the question is whether the Eurozone members' more established economies have the political will to impose the necessary solutions. Our Gen Xers are the generation who follow most of us here in the symposium today. They will be the ones who live with the decisions that government regulators and stakeholders make today. In the future needs of Canadians, that form, that form the crux of the message that you take away from my comments today. We have to ensure that we get through the reforms right. Failure is not an option. Again, Canada has the opportunity to be a global leader. Domestic decisions we make now will resonate, not just in Canada, but globally. At the domestic level, in addressing the need for Canadians to be prepared for retirement, as well as various milestones in their lives, I believe that we need to begin with the fundamental component of our current system, one which addresses the need for all Canadians, including our Gen Xers, to get informed professional financial advice. It all comes down to the client-advisor relationship. <coughs> Excuse me. I need some water. Research studies indicate that consumers' learning about financial topics occurs at times that are closely aligned with major life events. Take a look at the chart up on the screen. We can highlight a person's first job 
saving and financing of a new house, having a child, saving for that child's education, we can follow this chart all the way through to living in retirement. At any point in this life cycle, consumers need unbiased information that is, the communicate, that is communicated in plain language and that can be understood. With governments increasingly stretched for money, it's becoming increasingly obvious that consumers need to plan early. Start with that first job, starting with the first job. Plan for their first home purchase, plan for a family, plan for the education of their children, plan for the unexpected problems that can materialize, divorce, illness, premature death of a spouse, etc. Financial advisors do just that. They plan for all of these things, and it's increasingly important that Canadians develop an early and long-lasting relationship with a financial advisor who can help prepare for all the major life events that they will encounter, both positive and negative. Now, let's talk about some of the Canada-specific hurdles we and our clients are facing. Julie Dixon, the superintendent for the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, spoke at the Economic Club of Canada last month. Julie had a great deal to say about the reforms that are coming out of the global financial crisis and how regulators in the banking, insurance, security sectors are implementing changes agreed to by the ministers of finance for the G20 countries. What I found very interesting were her remarks about debt. She noted that the federal government has taken steps to tightly tighten the availability of credit in the housing market. This is important because the historically low interest rates currently available will not last forever, and when they start rising again, people may very well feel that they have overextended themselves. She noted that banks have an incentive to lend given the current economic environment of low margins. The message of OSFI to financial institutions is that current levels of interest rates may have already made borrowing extremely attractive to all borrowers, and therefore institutions should guard against loosening historical underwriting standards, for example, by moving to higher loan-to-value ratios or waiving any due diligence requirements. Such remarks from a regulator are intended to send a message to financial institutions, but are they listening? The subtle persuasion by a regulator on a financial institution does little to alert the consumer to potential future risk. This emphasizes the importance of the role of the financial advisor. Assuming a mortgage for a home is a decision that should be made within the context of a well-thought-out financial plan. This is part of the educational value that financials, financial advisors play. They help the consumer understand the difference between good debt and bad debt. Too many Canadians fail to understand the consequences of carrying over a monthly credit card balance, just as they fail to understand the consequences of assuming too great a mortgage when rates are low. A properly structured mortgage is generally a good debt, provided the market prices for real estate is based on solid fundamentals. A further challenge for us and our clients lies in the product development and convergence, and particularly the regulatory responses to them. Product development in the banking, insurance, and security sectors is big business. Companies in these sectors are watching the trends to determine what products will be most in demand in the future and then work to ensure that they have the right products to meet the investing consumer's needs. We have been witnesses to the competition between the sectors. Mutual funds cannot be offered by insurance companies, but insurance companies can offer segregated funds that mimic the structure of mutual funds with the added feature of an insurance wrapper that may be provided added that may provide added protection against the risk associated associated with market fluctuations the insurance sector has an ideal product for investors who have entered the divesting stage in their life cycle annuities 
The mutual fund industry responds with the development of systematic withdrawal plans. And the banking sector has not sat on the sidelines. They have established insurance companies, mutual fund companies within their wealth management wings. The banking and security sectors are well aware of the demographic shift that is taking place, and they are developing products that are intended to challenge annuities, too. Our challenge for consumers, advisors, and the companies in the various sectors is that each of the banking, insurance, and security sectors have their own regulators who take a somewhat different approach to the regulation of products and advice. This is a significant problem as the cost to advisors who operate in more than one sector is steadily increasing. The result, fewer advisors are going into the business, and that means that fewer consumers will have access to financial advice at a time when products have never been more complex and the need for individuals to use financial advisors has never been greater. Sounds like a perfect storm to me, and the action has to be taken now to ensure Canadians have access to the advice they clearly need. That brings me back to the needs of consumers of financial products in Canada. I believe that relationship I have with my clients uh, share many similarities with the relationship people have with their health care providers. In both cases, they are long-term relationships that are based on trust. A good advisor, like a good health care provider, is interested in preventative techniques. As an advisor, my role is to help my clients reach the milestones we have set and navigate the hurdles they will encounter. This is done through preparation and planning. Good decisions are not made by chance. They are made through sound research and being provided with the right information that will allow them to make appropriate decisions. And at the end of the day, it's my job to ensure that they have the right choices and decisions, that they've made the right choices and decisions. Financial advisors appreciate that we are in an era of unprecedented change. What disturbs me is that often the regulatory response to the current challenges seems to run counter to the stated policy objectives of governments. The result is that in an era where there is such a clear need for consumers to use an advisor, advisors are increasingly unable, unavailable to consumers. This trend has not just stopped, but reversed. With increasing product convergence, advisors remain accountable to different regulators who take different approaches with respect to the regulation of products and the advisor-client relationship. There is also a difference in the approach taken by regulators in engaging stakeholders. To move forward in a meaningful way and to ensure consumers have access to the advice they need, regulators must become far more engaged with the financial advisors who have an understanding of consumer needs. This engagement is largely lacking. By way of an analogy, I would note that the healthcare professional, like other professions, are directly involved in developing the rules and regulations that govern their relationship with their clients. This is viewed as necessary to ensure that the healthcare professional is prepared to deal not only with the crisis situations, but foster a preventative approach to the patient's general health and thereby reduce long term costs on the system. Similarly, for financial advisors to provide the services necessary to better ensure the long-term financial health of consumers and reduce the strain and demands of the public sector, then financial advisors must play a larger role in the regulation of the delivery of financial advice and products. Governments and regulators must take a public position that supports financial advisors. The government policy and regulatory policy must be designed to promote not only 
new entrants into our profession, but help educate the public about the benefits to be gained in having a financial advisor. Governments and regulators in other jurisdictions are now actively promoting to the public the need to use a financial advisor. Why we're not doing this in Canada, I just can't understand. However, let me be very clear about something. All the blame does not rest with governments or regulators. Financial advisors have to step forward and admit that they have made errors and have missed opportunities that, if acted upon, could very well have addressed the problems we face today. I recall the Federal Minister of Finance, the Honorable Jim Flaherty, speaking at the Toronto Sales Congress a few years ago. His closing remarks to us, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said, we have to make sure that people out there don't listen to their neighbors or word of mouth when it comes to investing. Unless, of course, they belong to advocates. Unless, of course, they belong to advocates. That was very powerful words coming from the Minister of Finance. He is an advocate's supporter. But missed opportunities happen, and it's what we learn from them that's important. I believe we're at the point again where opportunity is knocking, and this time advocates will not make the same mistake. We can use the federal PRPP to create a space for financial advisors and approach the minister for a meeting where we can pick up on a statement to our sales congress. It's not just the promotion of products that's important. It's the promotion of financial advisors by the government of Canada. Government policy with respect to Canadians seeing to their own uh, preparedness for life events, including retirement, will not succeed unless they are getting investment advice from their neighbors or word of mouth. We can work with the governments to ensure that that message comes from accredited financial advisors. It's never been advocates' style to ask governments for handouts. We prefer talking about solutions to problems and demonstrating our willingness to work with governments to solve problems. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's time for advocates to sit down with the decision makers in Ottawa and talk about what we think can and must be done to ensure their policy objectives are achieved. The opportunity to act is now, and I know we are not about to make the same mistake twice. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jack, and I hope your voice is still with you. It sounds like it is. Next, I would like to introduce to you a gentleman on my right who is on the second day of the job as the new chair of the board of, of Advocates. <laughs> Dean Owen is from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. He's a veteran of our business. Um, I would like to make one little correction that is in his bio, his official bio in your, in your agenda. Uh, and for all of those who think there may be a, 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 a perceived conflict of interest that he sits as the chair of the insurance of the uh, Saskatchewan Insurance Council while sitting as the chair of the board here, he is a past chair and is not currently on the Insurance Council. But certainly his experience there uh, will be very valuable to not only advocates but to his presentation for us uh, today. Uh, by way of a personal note, some of you may or may not know, but Dean is, is an accomplished athlete and coach and is currently the head coach uh, of the women's uh, goalies for the women's varsity team at the University of, Sask University of Saskatchewan. Uh, so Dean is going to come forward and address with us some of the processes and changes that are coming, uh, coming down the road to us in terms of the advisor perspective. Dean, please. Rock stars and accomplished athletes. Ooh, that's great. I, uh, I I used to play goal myself, and it's surprising what you can get away with when you're a goalie. Uh, everybody, 
you can walk out on the out on the outside of the, the uh, CN Tower without the harness, and they say, "What is he doing?" Oh, he's a goalie. Okay, it's just understood. <laughs> Prior to assuming my role as chair of uh, of Advocus, um, I was the vice chair, and I was responsible for reporting uh, to the board so that they could be well aware of the policy issues that were on the radar for Advocus in developing the strategies that, would, uh, that we would use to address them. This past year has been uh, r- simply extraordinary in regards to the issues that have come down the pipe compared to previous years. Uh, the number of game-changing issues that advisors will face, obviously, my learning today is incredible. And at Advocus, we keep a grid that we update as often as we can And it identifies the issues that are absolutely important uh, that require our attention um, and our our active participation. This list seems to keep growing. And the statement of priorities issued uh, by regulators this year has identified a number of critical areas that will require stakeholder engagement. And I would like to direct my comments this afternoon mostly to the issues that impact financial planner compensation. And our process to identify the issues we at Advocus do deal with and the method we employ to deal with them. There are two main drivers uh, that uh, prompt Advocus into action, consumer protection and access to choice and the value of advice and financial advisors. Admittedly, they're pretty broad concepts and the number of issues that they capture would be well beyond the resources that we have available to deal with them. So the Regulatory Affairs Group uses a five-point system that has been developed and approved by the Board of Advocates that help target these issues more carefully. In order for an issue to be taken up at Advocates, it must fall within one of the five pillars. For instance, professionalism of financial advisors. I would note that we are currently looking at concepts with respect to mandatory membership. One can see how this uh, this would be a driver identified on the previous slide Members and associations such as Advocates will help ensure that consumers can expect a higher standard of service, and it can also be structured to ensure that fraudsters such as Earl Jones are more easily identified. If their name doesn't appear on a roster or a roll, then there's a good chance you're dealing with somebody that doesn't follow a professional code of conduct. Regulatory convergence, we see this at both the international level and at the domestic level. As I'll be discussing shortly, the banning of third-party commissions and the, ap- and the application of a statute-based fiduciary duty represent a wave that is coming to Canada f- from foreign jurisdictions. The third pillar, distribution of financial services and compensation, third-party commission bans, statute-based fiduciary duties, and the MER issue could certainly be caught by pillars two and three at- And I would also uh, quickly highlight that an an issue such as a review going on with respect to the regulation of MGAs um, on this file, and sorry, on regulation of the MGAs would be caught in this pillar as well. We've been very active on this file and have made a strong case that MFDA-type regulation would not serve the insurance sector well, nor would it serve consumers well. There is a need for financial advisors to be able to work with a number of MGAs, and it was, it was a pleasure to see Jerry and the BC Insurance Council is going that route in, in, order, in uh, managing their MGA, in their MGA regulation. Pillar four, supporting the business of financial advisors. To this point, advocates advisors have noted how important email is to reaching out to the Canadians and uh, how important it is to reaching out um, as an advisor. Federal government has been working on an anti-spam legislation, and while there is much uh, we like about this legislation, it has one big flaw in that the net is being cast and it is covering off a very wide range of business. Interestingly, a few weeks ago there was an article in the Toronto Star and the Ottawa Citizen, and the points being made in the article were clearly aligned with what the arguments being made in our submissions to the government and to regulators. Indeed, Advocus was singled out in the article as being a leader in this effort, and now other regulators in support to the anti-spam bill is being reviewed in light of our concerns. Care must be exercised by regulators in crafting rules and policies to ensure that they are not needlessly interfering with our ability to do our jobs. 
And on the last of the five pillars, I would note that work has been done with respect to the pooled registered pension plans, or better known as PRPPs. We applaud the government for adopting a private sector solution, but we still see problems here, and we'll get a chance to meet with Minister Menzies again and present our suggestions. We feel that there needs to be clearer recognition of the role of advisors. The PRPP is simply a tool that can be used by consumers, but absent having financial advisors, uh, advisors will, uh, for consumers will not understand how integrate, uh, well, they, they will not understand how to integrate the PRPP into a broader financial plan aimed at helping them achieve their goals. I'd also like to comment on the approach that we have taken in analyzing issues, which is one of the increasing, which is one that we are seeing regulators increasingly adopt in principle. Over the past several years, we have spoken with regulators right across Canada and have promoted an outcomes-based approach to regulation, whereby the regulators, stakeholders, will first identify the problem that needs to be addressed, consult widely with a wide range of, stakeholder, with a wide range of stakeholders, consider all possible policy options to address the identified problem, and then select the least intrusive option that will allow the regulators to achieve the desired policy outcome. I believe that, the, that any proper issue review must adopt such a sound approach. So let's take a, few, a look at a few of the issues. The UK has undertaken an extensive review of the distribution of financial products to retail investors. This review has been ongoing for six years. Australia has had to deal with the fallout from significant fraud cases that have cost investors and pensions dearly. To name only a few issues from 2009, Timber Corp and Storm Financial, investors lost close to $2 billion. The Retail Distribution Review, or RDR, in the United Kingdom concluded that the mis-selling of products has been a major problem and the drastic steps that had to be taken to address these. In the UK, the FSA found that banks were mis-selling insur insurance products to investors. The result here was that Lloyd's, Barclays, the Royal Bank of Scotland and the HSBC had to repay to consumers close to $10 billion. In Saskatchewan, that's our annual budget, less our snowfall removal. <laughs> that's huge. Clearly, matters uh, related to fraud, mis-selling, and shattered consumer confidence are factors that will drive regulators to action. However, when I look at the Canadian uh, landscape, I don't see the same problems. In particular, the huge fraud cases and the clear and, and ongoing mis-selling of financial products. Nor do I see the incidents of mis-selling or fraud as being a justification for banning third-party commissions. As within existing insurance or securities laws the regula and regulations, there are already mecha uh, mechanisms in there, in there to deal with these matters. Accordingly, I question if the regulatory responses in these two jurisdictions are reasonable and rational reactions to the identified problems, or was it simply a matter that regulators overreacted to a situation due to external pressures? And what will be the consequences of such drastic change? Will the impact of availability of financial advisors for consumers be affected? I think in the UK, the number has gone in the last 10 years from 150,000 advisors to 50,000. And words out of Australia was that the number of financial advisors have been, has been reduced by 70%. Prior to taking action, these are questions that a regulator should be able to answer. I don't think that the regulators in either the UK or Australia are in a position to provide the answers. And I know in Canada we aren't. Action should only be taken when the consequences are identified. Another important issue relates, relates to fiduciary duties, um, and Mary mentioned those, about those this morning. In addition to the banning of third-party commissions, the UK on, and Australia are looking at the imposition of a statute-based fiduciary standard. The United States, in their billion-page Dodds-Frank reform bill, is also looking to the imposition of a statute-based fiduciary duty. Uh, how does, and how will this play out in Canada? Well, if you take the approach to the issue review that I noted at the beginning, the first thing that regulators should do before taking any action is to identify the problem. When it comes to fiduciary duties, Canada already has a common law fiduciary standard. It is principle-based, 
in nature and it can apply to any situation if the need calls. Why then would we use scarce regulatory resources to impose a statute-based standard when fiduciary duties already apply to financial advisors in Canada? Further, before acting, what would the consequences be of, of imposing such a standard? In preparation for a request for comment on this very issue, we're in the process of identifying the added costs that a fiduciary standard would impose to the industry and its financial advisors. It would directly result in escalating costs with no apparent benefits to consumers, to advisors, to regulators, or to the government. Sometimes it's often tempting for governments and regulators to follow a trend, particularly during trouble times like we're in. But it is the responsibility of the regulators to only act when action is called for. Because action may be called for in other jurisdictions doesn't mean it has to be called for here. And allow me to com uh, comment briefly on the MER issue. It was mentioned this morning. The federal government has indicated that the Senate committee hearings to address the differences in the cost of products in Canada and the U.S. will now also look at services, at least to the extent that they apply to MERs. There's been much said in the press about MERs in Canada being among the very highest in the world. This despite the fact that the studies, such as the one that McKenzie pre presented this morning, um, that there are no differences. The tax implications, when all considered, are quite comparable. But this issue goes more to the, just the level of the MERs. It cuts at the very concept of the value of, of advice. I would note that when you deconstruct the MER, you're going to see much as, as what Charlie showed this morning, that it involves about 1% that goes towards compensation, and the actual advisor gets somewhere between 0.4 and 0.8 of that. That's what we're dealing with in terms of the compensation. And to me, that's a pretty good deal for, for a client to get professional advice from, our, from advisors that we have. And this is what we need to have to show, what, what, what we need to show governments and regulators. Absent our advice, consumers can't make those investment decisions, and they can't make saving decisions, and that will lead to the load of governments uh, that, will, that will lessen the load on the governments and help Canadians achieve their financial goals. So what's in store for Canada? Before I provide my assessment, let me make a point about evidence-based regulation. Howard Weston, the chair of the OSC, recently stated, there is an increasing recognition today that evidence-based policymaking is key to better financial market regulation. You heard this morning from Mary to confirm that the direction that they will consult, and I hope they consult advisors as well, and she continued that they will discover if there is a problem in existence and search for alternatives for, at least the, uh, for, for the least intrusive change in regulation. The Government of Alberta has the Government of, of Alberta Guiding Principles Regulation. British Columbia, British Columbia has adopted an outcomes and principle-based approach to, uh, to regulation. And the good news is that we're seeing these regulators using what we view as appropriate language and, uh, and approach to regulation. When Advocus speaks to regulators, about identifying a problem prior to, to consider regulation. It's close to what the OSC calls evidence-based and what is known as strong evidence in Alberta. Consider for a moment the advocates' approach. First, identify the problem, and the second element is consult widely. This is a gathering of evidence. So I think we're all on the same page. If we take a well-reasoned approach to the problem identification, we'll see that many perceived problems here really just don't exist. In gathering evidence on the banning of commissions, we note that the evidence of the problem identified in other jurisdictions just doesn't exist here. With respect to the statute-based fiduciary standard, we note that we have a perfectly functioning fiduciary standard here. And in fact, it operates perfectly and provides regulators and courts with the flexibility they need to arrive at just outcomes. With MERs again, it comes down to doing the research. And as was presented here this morning with Charlie, they've done that research. And cutting through the distractions, and we see that consumers who have a good advisor are getting a real good deal. What they should do is look at what, how come it cost me $39.95 for a book in Canada when I see on the stage, or see on the price tag, it costs $29.95 in the U.S. I'd be okay if they charged me $39.95, just don't tell me what I can pay for it in the U.S., actually. <laughs> Without question, the United Kingdom and Australia will ban third-party commissions this coming year. 
I strongly suspect the United Kingdom, Australia, and the United States will implement a statute-based fiduciary duty. But before Canadian regulators consider going down these paths, let's take a step back, do our due diligence before we follow an international trend, and let's think for ourselves and determine if there's need to do as others are doing. Should it be determined that we do not, we do not need to follow the international trend, I would emphatically note that it's not a sign of weakness on the part of our regulators. To support this statement, I have to look at the international trends in the 1980s and the 1990s to loosen restrictions in the banking sector, whereby retail banks and investment banks were no longer required to operate as separate entities. Virtually all the G20 countries followed the U.S. lead in loosening restrictions. What did we do here in Canada? We did our due diligence. We decided that it was not in our best interest to follow the international trend. And today, without question, one must conclude that the right decision was made. The rest of the world is looking at our system as the model. Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of Canada, has been appointed to the head of the Financial Stability Board, which is the global banking regulator. All of this because Canada resisted the pull to play, follow the leader, and in turn has become the leader. With the increased pressures for greater regulatory convergence at the international level, it becomes increasingly important for Canadian policymakers to stand strong despite the criticism that they are not doing enough to keep Canadian markets strong and safe. Sometimes it's difficult to just say no. It's understandable and important that Canadian regulators are watching what is transpiring globally. The past several years have demonstrated very clearly that financial markets are global in nature. But I would caution that while monitoring is very prudent, taking ac action absent the model advocates promotes for policymakers can have unintended and dangerous consequences. I look at my clientele, and I know that my, my clientele is very average Canadian. You look at what Jack talked about in terms of the life cycle. They ask for my guidance in things such as saving money for retirement, education, and rainy days, and that they're protected by the insurance that I can get them. But they also come to me every once in a while when life hits them from the side with a 200-mile-an-hour train by the way of a lost job, by the way of a lost loved one, or a critical illness. Our system here and today in Canada allows me and 11,000 other advocates advisors to deal with the high net worth clients and also to deal with consumers and clients who are not yet high, high net worth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Curtis Finley. Uh, Curtis is from Canmore, Alberta, where he is uh, working with the company he founded, Compass Financial Planning. Uh, he has spent more than 30 years in our industry and has developed tremendous expertise in the area of, of effective tax effective investments for individuals, uh, entities, and, and, and charitable organizations and foundations. Uh, Curtis is also very active in our association as he serves on our Legal Regulatory Policy Committee nationally as well as chairing our subcommittee uh, on investments and the Provincial Advocacy Committee in, in Calgary. So Curtis is going to talk to us, uh, address us now as to how we are to assess as advisors the new products that are being offered to those Canadian advisors who are licensed to sell insurance, mutual funds, investments, and exempt products and to investment brokers. So, Curtis, if you'd please come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So, go ahead. So, you promised some fireworks. There they are. So, does everybody know the most commonly asked question on earth? This may not have hit your news here. A couple years ago, this hit our news out in Alberta. Most commonly asked question is, how does this affect me? And the average Canadian asks themselves that question 200 times a day. So it's the weather this morning when you got up, what was served for breakfast. And I'm willing to bet you all day today, with all the uncertainty and all the question marks, with every speaker getting up and talking about the changes, that we have no idea where it's all going, everyone sat there and said, so how do I run my practice in this environment? 
Like everyone's got questions, nobody's got answers. So what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about what you might want to do in your practice as you assess each wholesaler as they walk in your offices and talk to you about the latest product or the latest service that they want you to promote. Now I happen to wear three hats in my job. I, I am a, an advisor, I'm branch manager, I'm also a compliance officer. And in my dealership, everybody in Alberta is all a member of one organization, it's all mine. So I get to ask myself these questions every minute of the day. So as I looked around the room today, I noticed an awful lot of stress. I guess I'm just accustomed to it. I, I'm used to the regulators walking up and talking the way they do and never actually giving us any answers, just telling us what they're thinking. So the factors that are generating new products around us, and I'm going to paint a slightly different picture because I think in the next five years we're going to see an explosion of new products coming at us. And we better be ready for them because they really are going to come. And here's the trends, and I'm going to go through the trends pretty quickly because I want to get into the actual assessment that advisors can do as quickly as I can. Supply and demand pressures are pretty obvious, I think. We see them in our jobs every day. There's really a number of studies, and they always come out with the exact same things over and over again. The two things that the general population are paranoid about is, will my money run out before I do, right? And more than that, will my health give out before I enjoy my retirement? Those are the things that are just overpoweringly concerning our clients. And what do we do for a living? We actually sell solutions to both of those. I mean, what a terrific industry we work in. For all this doom and gloom we've talked about all day, we are very, very fortunate to do what we do for a living. So through CI insurance and long-term care, and then, of course, the various portfolio strategies we have, we actually provide solutions to our, our friends and neighbors and our clients. So the 10-year returns on equities, let's just be open about this. If you were to go back 10 years ago and bought a 10-year GIC, you would have got the same rate of return as you would have gotten the average mutual fund portfolio in Canada. So when your clients say that to you, they are actually being accurate. This is not hogwash. This is actually the truth. That's fine because we've had two major collapses in the last 10 years. But it is true. They paid MERs, and they went through all the market volatility and all the stuff we've all dealt with. Our job is to keep them steady on course, keep them moving through the markets, long-term views. The sandwich generation, uh, and those of, I'm sure everyone in the room knows who that is, they just like volatility, and no kidding. I was talking to a client not that long ago where he was talking about little Johnny had tapped him on the shoulder for not the first down payment for the first house, but the down payment for the second house, now that he's moving up. Little Johnny's in his 30s and hasn't saved a nickel. Meanwhile, the parents, of course, are having failing health in their 80s. And this person's about ready to retire, and he's writing checks both directions. And, and you're surrounded by people all the time facing the exact same issues in life. This, of course, creates opportunities for new products. All of these issues that I'm talking about, if you manufacture product for a living, this is your sweet spot. Having a, a situation where uh, public companies have been offering products, and we all know how that works, the investor relations people are talking to their investors and saying, this quarter last year to this quarter this year, you know, looking at sales, looking at revenues, looking at net revenues, you know it's tough. So they've got to offer new products to our clients in order to get their sales volumes up. The sustained low interest rate environment that we're in is uh, certainly playing into everyone's um, situation. SAG funds and the opportunity to offer guarantees, and we're seeing mutual fund clients now move back towards the SAG fund environment, that's driven primarily by no interest rate guarantees to go to. Uh, the, you know, the securities are bouncing around, and they're looking for the guarantees. In fact, I would say that most of the advisors I work with, the majority of those stake fund sales are generated by the clients, not by the advisors. People are coming to us looking for guarantees. The media attack on fund fees, uh, I think it's a terrific opportunity for them to, to uh, ask the question. I think it's a terrific opportunity for us to answer it. I, I don't think we should be hiding away from the conversation. I think it's, it's a good conversation to have. It leads us in many other directions, too. 
It's interesting to me especially that the media has absolutely no idea how to calculate a true uh, risk or a true uh, cost of an investment. If they did, if they went and looked at some of the other uh, products that uh, investors purchased, I'm sure they'd leave the mutual funds alone pretty quickly because there's a lot higher fees in other products. The MFDA advisor resignations, and it's interesting, I, I was curious whether it would come up here. I've had five different people today alone walk up to me and mention that they're considering vacating the space. I would guess that if, if, as little as 10% of all the advisors who were talking about leaving the MFDA space left. It would create a huge opportunity for the manufacturers of products in the insurance side, the exempt market side, and the investment counselors that are looking for referrals. Because they're all standing there looking for money, and that sure looks to me like an opportunity for billions of dollars to transfer around. And really, the key in our industry for new product development continues to be all the software enhancements. Um, one of my past jobs many years ago, I dealt with product development in the head office of an insurance company. And the thing that always held us back was we had the idea and we had it on the blackboard, but if you can't administer it cheaply, then you can't offer the product. Nowadays, with software development through the Internet software, they can develop these tools very rapidly. And so they can now do the record keeping, the administration cost effectively, and, and they can start to bring out new products almost as quickly as they can design them. So now I want to walk into the product um, selection process that I would recommend advisors start asking themselves about. In my capacity, I get a chance to hear a lot of complaints. Partly because, yes, I'm involved with a dealer, but secondly, I go to a lot of forums where other compliance officers are. And I'd hate to tell the room this, but the truth is about a third of them are that the advisor didn't understand what they were selling. I'd love to paint you a different picture, but that is, at the end of the day, the problem. So what do we do about that? Well, one of them is, you know, we pay attention when the OSC says to us, know your product is a requirement. It is. It's a fundamental requirement. And I think advocates, uh, as well as uh, any other organization in our industry, should all be talking about that quite openly. Uh, a subsection of our subcommittee for advocates went and met with the OSC a few weeks ago, and we were there talking about suitability. And we talked to the staff of the OSC, and they made a point to us to say it is not your dealer's responsibility to know the product and to decide if you should sell it. It's the advisor's responsibility. And they are the, se the senior regulator in Ontario. So, you know, the MFDA and IROC will also say product review committees and put it on the shelf and all those things that all the dealers have to do. At the end of the day, it starts and stops with us. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, have we become too reliant on our intermediaries? Our mutual fund dealer has a product review committee, and they spend hours and hours and hours exhaustively deciding which product and which company can be on the shelf. But make no mistake, what they're really asking themselves is, does it make sense that they offer it to us? They're not going advisor by advisor, and just because you have 600 advisors does not mean that all 600 people should sell a product that's approved. If you're a member of an MGA and they've got 1,500 uh, contracted people, just because they offer a service or a product doesn't mean it fits for you. So one of the things you need to think about is do you have a process that when somebody walks in your office and says, I really want you to sell this, do you personally have something that you could defend, the process itself you could defend if somebody went after you? First question I always ask myself is, what is the history of this supplier? The little fine print at the bottom of mutual funds, you know, past performance is no indicator of future, you know. Absolutely true of investments, but I would argue that if you take a look at a supplier that manufactures products, if they constantly don't prepare their wholesalers, if they always get the tax things wrong, if they're always too aggressive, their administration is always wrong on the launch. It tends to be the same companies over and over again. So after a while, when you're hitting your head against a wall, maybe stop and use a different supplier because there's a lot of good ones in our industry. We're very blessed that way. But there are a couple of players that seem to get it wrong over and over again. We should start to be very selective. We get to, we're very lucky because we get to vote with our clients' wallets, not just our own. So we can actually have a big influence if every advisor decides to cut out the bad players. The next question is, does this product fit my practice? 
And what I mean by that is, you know, I have a certain administration team that I've built for my practice. I can provide a certain level of service to a certain type of product, but not all products. You know, so, so for example, um, let's say I'm not a group expert, and I don't have staff that are experts in the group insurance area. And a client comes to me and says, you know, I've got 500 employees and I need a group plan. If I can't service it, I shouldn't be selling it. And an awful lot of times I see complaints where advisors have to find themselves in a corner and have to admit that, you know, they just can't service the products they're selling. They don't have the expertise in it. Does the product fit my profile? So if I've spent 15 years working with a client base and I've continually told them that I'm very conservative and I believe in in tax-advantaged income that's predictable, do I then turn around and start offering an exempt market product to them where they're risking their capital? Is that going to be a good experience for them? Are they going to get really confused about who I am and, and what I stand for? And again, you see that a lot that the profile of the advisor just simply doesn't match up with the product that they've sold. And that's why the clients get confused. Are the tax implications explainable? And by explainable, I mean not to the client. Try to imagine yourself explaining the tax implications of the product or the strategy to their accountant. I mean, if you can't explain it to the other professional who knows tax, then why are you doing it? And one thing, you know, just for clarification, I would certainly never hold myself out to be a tax expert, not even close to it. I, you know, I may talk about tax strategies, but I'm always going to have, you know, my tax specialist with me talking to their tax specialist. I talk big picture, I get out of the way real quick. Safest place to be on the shore. Is the client reporting timely and clear? With every product design, every time they take a look at it, when that statement arrives, can the client themselves understand what's being said? Most recently, you probably heard the MFDA is now requiring us to have statements sent quarterly from the dealer, and they're going to be sent out directly to the client, whether they're a name account or a nominee or self-directed account. Well, you know what? If they're arriving 45 days later, it really doesn't matter if we send it every week. It's not going to be of any benefit to anybody. They're not reading them because the information is too old. So, if anything, we really need to get to a basis where Canadians are getting online reporting and they can see their fund portfolios right there for them. Is the product portfolio or, or portable within the industry? And this is something that, you know, we always require of, of all of our suppliers is that, you know, we've had a great relationship for a long time. I am one of the odd people in the room that have been with the same dealer for 20 years. Not many people can say that, but at the end of the day, anything that I sell is portable if I decide to leave. I've got, a, I've got a relationship that I have to worry about, which is my client relationship. That's the one I most focus on. So if, I, if something else happens and I need to move on to somewhere else, I need to be able to deal with those people. They haven't signed on to deal with a dealer. They've signed on to deal with me, and the requirement is that I'm there to serve them. Do any incentives that are offered by the wholesaler compromise your ethics? A classic is the other day, you know, someone approached me and said, we're now manufacturing this great new fund, great new portfolio, and guess what, we'll pay you an extra 0.1 of 1% trailer. So instead of 1%, I get 1.1. I mean, I can't even tell you how absolutely disgusting that is to me. But I suppose it must work, otherwise why would they do it? So our trade-off in our world is we simply put that down in print, our clients receive it, and they sign off on it. So we, every time any manufacturer comes to us with any little gimmick like that, we say, hey, fine, if we want to sell your product, we will. Then we disclose it to the client, and they sign off on it. That's, you know, that's the way we happen to deal with those things. Um, you probably know intrinsically within yourself if something just doesn't smell right. You know, the classic, I'll give you some hockey tickets if you sell my product, that kind of stuff. Those days are long gone, I really think, in our industry, and if not, they should be. Do you have access to the current value? And this is a little bit of a shot at our friends in the insurance business. Um, I've got a fairly good-sized SAG fund business. About half of the SAG funds that I've got on book, I can actually see them on my computer, just like my mutual fund portfolios, any day I want. But about half of the suppliers is still like this black pit, 
I've sent the money to them, and the only time I know what the rate of return is is about the same time my client's receiving it in the mail. It's not really great for an advisor to have absolutely no idea what's going on inside those portfolios. And I'm sure when the clients call me and say, hey, Curtis, like, how am I doing? Me saying, well, let me get a hold of the insurance company and I'll find out. That must not exactly ratchet up the, the life experience for these people quite the way they want it. Is the product that they're asking you to sell, is it liquid? I don't know how many people here have an exempt securities um, license or registration, but one of the things that you always have to contemplate with those products is, are they liquid? I happen to have one of those licenses for, for supervision purposes. I'm not actually actively marketing those products to my clients. Um, but one thing I've noticed is an awful lot of them are li illiquid. Somebody comes looking for their money, and they may have to wait months before they see it. Are the redemption fees? Can you explain the redemption fees? Now, that might seem simple, but recently, you know, we had one client pull out of a, a self-directed account, two different mutual fund companies, both with DSC redemption fees with one of our other advisors that still uses DSC. And what I noticed was the DSC calculation was different between the two fund companies. I popped open the prospectus. Both fund companies administered exactly right. What do you think the odds are that the advisor knew that the calculation would be different? One was based on the original amount invested. One was based on the current market value. I can tell you when the client called and queried, the advisor couldn't answer the question. And that's how it ended up on my desk. So, you know, make absolutely certain you understand your supplier's calculation so you can explain it to your clients. This next one's a big one because under oath, the number of times I've sat and listened to advisors have to admit to usually other lawyers representing clients um, that they had never read the prospectus or the information folders or the OMs of the products they sold. Just because we have a license doesn't mean we know everything about the product. The reason we, hold, we hand them that disclosure is so they'll read it. It's a little bit ridiculous if we haven't read it too, isn't it? And yet it happens all the time. And unfortunately, my experience has been the bigger the advisor, the higher the earnings, the less likely they are to have the time to read the OMs. It's, you know, they have hundreds of clients, so the time demands are huge. So outside of the only advice, and I'm sure you've heard it from others before, shrink your offerings so that you only follow very few suppliers and very few products so you have time to stay up to date. It's about the only advice I can give you because time management is really difficult. And the, and the more clients you have, the more difficult it is. And what disclosures do you need? And for every agent and every advisor, financial planner in Canada, um, just because the regulators give you a list and your suppliers give you a list doesn't mean that's the entire list. As I mentioned before, if there's additional compensation, we disclose that. It's not required. If our, the owner of our dealer offers a product, it's not required. We still do it. We, we over-disclose. And, you know, do everything you can to protect yourselves because in case you haven't noticed, every time something goes wrong, somehow it's magically all your fault. You know, they always show up at your door looking for you to claw back your commissions or they show up at your door wanting to blame you and put you into enforcement action. So always put yourself first when it comes to choosing products and, and services. Thank you. Thanks very much, Curtis, and compliments on your, your candor and your frankness for some of these very important issues. Our last speaker today, Terry Zive, the president and CEO of Zive Financial Inc. I've known Terry for a long time. He runs a technical practice that he has learned to communicate to just about everybody in very simple and understandable terms. I think he is, quite frankly, a terrific role model and a go-to guy in this area. Uh, Terry's also served his community and our industry well as, as a past chair of CALU, uh, my predecessor as chair of our National Regulatory Affairs Committee, and many, many other issues. Terry is going to address us on some processes and perhaps give us some food for thought on some solutions for some of these problems we've been talking about going forward. Terry? Uh, thank you, Chris. 
Um, I'm acutely aware that, um, other than myself and Rob McCullough, we stand uh, between you and your first drink. So uh, I try try to do this in a a fashion that keeps your attention. Um, I'm also aware that, um, having spoken at at many of these, uh, I've, I've never actually spoken as the last speaker of a panel and at the end of the day. And so the advantage I've, I've realized of being the last speaker is that you get the opportunity to hear everyone else's views. However, the disadvantage is that everyone has used my material. So I'm going to try to cobble this together in a fashion that, um, that, that, that is somewhat interesting. So if we have the first slide, please. So th- the whole premise of this presentation, which... Um, uh, was written about three weeks ago, and little did I know at that time that um, the the other presenters, in, including um, uh, Charlie Sims and then the regulatory panel, would actually set the the foundation and the platform for the material that I want to to deal with. But the premise of this presentation is really about the fact that advisors, and I want this slide to stay on for a moment, advisors must confront change. And my belief is that we must promote professionalism as the necessary and best response to the challenges and opportunities our industry faces. And so what I'm planning to do is to build a case for the promotion of professionalism in the financial advisor universe. And so these clearly are my views, and um, I'm hopeful that they will become your views and those of the industry and that advocates will embrace them. So... Let's move on, if we may. Um, So clearly, as my wife would often say to me, a penetrating glance into the obvious, and the obvious is that our industry is clearly changing. It's been pointed out by my colleagues on the panel. It's been pointed out by all of the individuals who have spoken today. And clearly, this will continue to be the case for the next 10, 15 years. Change has been constant. It will continue to be there. Whether this is the result of the global crisis or the changing demographics of society or the changing policies of governments, where clearly self-reliance is now the touchstone. Every government is is making it very clear to people that you have to become self-reliant. That's really, it's really a secondary issue as to why these changes have occurred. But beyond noting that I suspect that all of the above noted elements play a role in the change at hand, I'd rather focus my comments on what I see ahead of us as advisors. I have a tendency to talk with my hands, so if I knock the mic off, we'll just keep going. The current environmental stressors that are changing our industry and our society are not going to go away. Therefore, in my opinion, it's imperative that we take control and responsibility for that change and that change that is taking place that will create our own future. So if we fail as advisors to be either proactive or prescriptive, then our future is going to be written by others. We're not going to be very happy because those others who will write our future are individuals who do not have the experience and understanding necessary to ensure that during a time of change, that the proper changes are made that will benefit consumers, advisors, governments, regulators, product developers, and product manufacturers. So, accordingly, my comments are going to focus not on the storied history of advocates, of which I am a very proud member, but rather I'll focus my comments on what it will mean to be a financial advisor in the future and how I propose that we shape our future as we ride a huge wave of change that's very clearly unstoppable and, frankly, in my opinion, very much needed. In my opinion, the greatest risk that we have as financial advisors into the future during these times of change is to do nothing and to have our futures dictated to us by those who lack our expertise and understanding. On the other hand, the greatest opportunity lies in taking the lead, although potentially fraught with danger, but in taking the lead, we can define our own futures. So, what do we know?
The first two bullet points are very clear, and they, again, are penetrating glances into the obvious. We've been told that time and time again. We've seen the federal government's task force on financial literacy make this point. Canadians are not starting to save and invest enough early enough, nor are they saving and investing enough to secure their long-term financial health. I'd also add that many Canadians are not properly securing themselves for their well-known hazards to which they are exposed, early death, disability, the issue of, of um, health. Um, so we, we really have to note a lack of what I would call prudential preparedness. We've heard from almost every level of government and governments of every political stripe the Canadians need to be saving and investing more to ensure their financial futures. The OECD has placed Canada near the top of the heap when it comes to a good quality of life and standard of living for retired Canadians. But with the increasing deficits and a rising retirement population, Canada, as well as every other developed country, is ill-prepared to shoulder the financial burden of ensuring a reasonable standard of living for all its citizens. Accordingly, there's clearly a shift, and people must be more prepared to provide for their own future needs and unforeseen events. In early November, Minister Menzies was in Amsterdam discussing the federal government's pooled, regist pooled registered pension plans, one of many initiatives aimed at ensuring that Canadians are ready for their financial futures. And furthermore, that they start preparing earlier in life. The private sector has been identified as the appropriate sector to provide these products and services to meet the, the future needs of Canadians. And this is certainly lending to product convergence. Intuitively, we know that given the increasingly complex nature of products, the reliance on the private sector to provide products and services, and a focus on increasing the financial literacy of Canadians, that the only logical source to deal with all of that is the financial advisor who must step up to the plate. It's the financial advisor who will help consumers understand not just the products, but how various products will help them achieve their desired financial outcomes. Next slide. I think, however, that we would all agree that, unfortunately, all financial advisors are not equal. I think we also would agree, furthermore, that consumers have a right to expect a consistent standard of advice from financial advisors. So you have the expectation on the consumer side of a consistent standard, yet we have on the advisor side not necessarily a consistent standard of advisor. So there's a gap. And while regulators and government agree that Canadians who receive financial advice have better outcomes, and we've seen that throughout the day, I believe we can improve on this situation. And I believe we can, we can work to close this gap between the expectations of consumers and the ability of advisors to actually perform. Regulators and governments have noted that a good advisor is really worth his or her weight in gold. But the consumer of financial products can't be assured that they're going to receive good advice because there are, advi there are advisors who are not properly trained and who are not keeping up to date and who are not following the latest policy and legal issues related to investing, succession planning, estate planning, tax planning, and I can continue the list. This, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, is a huge problem for our industry. With the added reliance on the private sector to provide the solutions, financial advisors must be proactive and look at not only where we are currently, but where we need to be headed. If advisors are truly going to be part of the solution, there must be an evolution of the profession. And they must evolve into a profession. 
If we don't take control of our own futures, it will be taken care of us by people who don't fully understand our increasingly complex business. So, where does this lead us? There's no question that consumers need the advice of a financial advisor if they're to make the right savings and investment decisions, as well as the right risk decisions relative to death, disability, and illness. Furthermore, we would all recognize that products will continue to get increasingly complex, and despite efforts by regulators and governments to enhance the level of financial literacy among Canadians, it's unrealistic to expect that all consumers will become do-it-yourselfers when it comes to investing. In fact, we don't want them to become do-it-yourselfers. So enhanced consumer education is not intended to prepare consumers to become their own financial advisors. It's intended to help consumers deal with simple financial concepts and help them identify good advisors. So given the focus on increased self-reliance for one's future financial needs, which the governments, both provincial and federal, are telling us to be the case, consumers must be in a position to trust that when they are dealing with a financial advisor, that that advisor knows what they're doing. It's not an unreasonable assumption. We have to ensure that consumers can be assured that all financial advisors have a minimum level of proficiency, that they remain current, and that they take steps to improve their skills over the course of their careers. The steps are necessary to get us to the point where we can assure consumers of a consistently high standard of service and knowledge by advisors. Excuse me. I want to rephrase that. The steps necessary to get us to the point where we can assure consumers of a consistently high standard of service and knowledge by advisors already exists in many respects. One example, and I'm not going to uh, belabor the advocacy side of the equation as yet, uh, but I want to use advocacy's code of professional conduct as one example. The code of conduct of advocacy lists eight guiding principles that all advocacy advisors are expected to abide by in their respective business activities. We also expect that an advocacy member will report to the association a breach of our code. In other words, actions that violate the letter and spirit of the code so that the association can investigate and take action. So consider for a moment the advocacy requirement in our code with respect to competency. An advocacy member is to exhibit their competency through the effective application of both skill and knowledge when providing products or services. Such competency is manifested through a commitment to ongoing education and training. An advocacy member makes a commitment to continuous learning through mandatory CE. Finally, consider the requirement in the Advocacy Code of Professional Conduct that requires a member to place the client's best interest first. This clearly indicates that an advocacy member shall act in a manner that places the client's interest, interest above his or her own. As we've heard from other presenters today, this concept of fiduciary duty is being considered in the US, the UK, Australia, and of course now regulators in Canada are looking into whether there is a need to state what already exists for advocacy members and put it into statute. This is understandable to a point, as all financial advisors don't have a mandatory code It requires them to place the consumer's interest above their own. So, ladies and gentlemen, how can we get all advisors to the same standards that advocacy members welcome? In my mind, there's a simple approach. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Why don't we simply work with what already exists to ensure consumers can rest assured that their financial advisor works to the same high standard that those in my association do? The answer, in in my opinion, is mandatory membership in a professional association. I want to be clear, not necessarily an advocate, although advocates would be one of the professional associations.